Today, we're going to tackle a very controversial topic that occasionally comes up and gets debated on the timeline. But I feel that generally the arguments that we see go into these debates are either poorly educated or the educated opinions that we do get are poorly represented because they're crammed into 240 characters. The argument from some people is that in order to be a valuable commentator or broadcast analyst in esports, you have to have played the game at a high elo. Personally, I find this argument is oftentimes used as a scam goat against talent that people don't like for other reasons and then misconstrue their feelings as to why they don't like them but either way let's have a look at it now so there are two main lines of logic to explore number one what does a broadcast actually need to be good and number two do you have to be able to do something at a high level in order to theoretically understand it at a high level? Both of these lines of logic can be split into two false ideas that people believe, and that's what we're going to break down now. Let's start with the first line. What does a broadcast actually need to be good? Here are the two false ideas that we're going to be looking at. One, there is a false idea that knowledge and insight are the most valuable parts of a broadcast. Two, there is a false idea that enthusiasts who are more likely to have high level knowledge are the most valuable part of a viewer base. So let's approach the first idea. Why are knowledge and insight not the most important part of a broadcast? I think this is the part that irks some people the most, both in the audience and also in aspiring casters who simply want a platform to espouse their knowledge and passion for a game without having a full understanding of what the purpose of the job actually is. So the first thing that you have to understand is that esports broadcasts are predominantly run for marketing purposes. They are not just done out of the goodness of a publisher's heart. Broadcasts cost a lot of money to run, and it's important to remember that media rights in esports don't work the same way that they do in traditional sports. We do occasionally see platforms pay for exclusivity rights, but in general, the media landscape in esports broadcasting is almost a monopoly. And these platforms are not behind a paywall, so the opportunity to make money from them is limited anyway. And the publisher owns the IP of the product, so the platforms are never going to be the entities that are making the most money off of this game in the first place. When if we compare that to sports, no one owns like the concept of football, you know? There is not a creator of football who is gonna be making the most money off of the NFL. It's important to note too that this is typically why we only ever get one broadcast per language for any league that is happening in esports. You have your official broadcast and that is it. Meanwhile, in traditional sports, what you may have is a number of different broadcasts who have the rights to the same product and they can all provide something slightly different. So broadcast A may focus more on entertainment and broadcast B may focus more on heavier analysis. Overall, because esports are just glorified marketing ploys, the main aim is to either sell the game or products within the game to the viewer. That, and you want to sell an investment into the esports so that then people's eyes are in front of sponsors too. High ELO players who are already financially invested in the game and exist in smaller numbers are not typically the best demographic to focus on for this, but we will get to that later. So straight up, we've already established that imparting knowledge is not in fact the primary goal of an esports broadcast. So what is the best way to achieve the primary goal of an esports broadcast? Entertainment. Entertainment is what keeps us engaged, watching, and coming back for more. Simply as human beings, it's what keeps us invested in just about anything. Entertainment can include education, but education past a certain point can become alienating and boring for a large number of people. Think about this. Why are people like David Attenborough and Bob Ross so popular? Is it because they taught us their disciplines at the highest level? No. It's because they were using an entertaining format to educate a broad demographic about something. And even then, not all of that product was education. If you were to then go and show that product to someone who has a high level knowledge or is an expert in those respective fields, they likely wouldn't learn anything from them because the level at which you would have to be teaching them would be so much higher in order for them to learn something new. But that level would then be way too high to engage the masses and you would lose the vast majority of your audience. Entertainment is created in different ways, but on a broadcast, it's oftentimes done through juxtaposition and conflict. For example, two casters who are riffing off of each other or an analyst desk who make crazy takes and disagree with each other. The value of these things is that they incite emotion in the viewer. Either the viewer has no preconceived opinion and it gives them a focus point to develop one and thus engaging them further, or they already do have an opinion and this either corroborates it or challenges it and that makes them more invested, 
one way or the other, they're either gonna laugh along or they're gonna get riled, but they want to be proven right. Analysts making dumb takes on the desk is usually a tactical decision made for the purpose of the broadcast, and a good host will encourage this along with disagreement on their desks. Oh, well, I you know my who. pick. <laughs> All aboard the Korean hype train, SK Telecom G1. Uh, thank you, Moni. I, I appreciate your, like, your SKT favorite, but I think it's more time for a oh! Royal Lucian. Oh! 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 And they're going to ruin the 4 for 4 home court advantage. Give. You make Maybe. excellent points. Let me tell you something. But let me tell you something. <laughs> when you got G2 on the other side, you got Chicago, you got Reed Curry. You got a Tom and you got Massimo. And then you got Jay Nett, Jacob Nauman, Captain Canada. They've led on this moment. They've had sweat on that. They've had tears. And G2, G2 will be your RCS world champion by the time it is over. I'm riding with paint. Give me G2 on this one, folks. How's the chat feeling about it? It's often extremely off-putting to have analysts who always want to be right because usually that means that they're prioritizing their own personal credit than they are the value of the desk as a whole. And the point about strong takes is why the best broadcasts will have a variety of personas of different levels of seriousness. Any broadcast of too much of the same thing will feel lacking. For example, take what is in my opinion still my favorite analyst desk of any esports event ever, the Overwatch World Cup 2018 desk, and you have all of these different examples. You have Bren, who's the comic relief slash instigator. Johnny is the ex-pro foil who will shut jokes down. And Josh is insightful and witty while also playing straight into the other two's personas and directly encouraging them. And then on top of that, you have Golden Boy, who clearly has a rapport with all of them anyway and knows how to tap into those personas and draw the most extreme versions of them out. What we end up with is what feels almost like a show that has these well-developed characters rather than just like four guys dryly talking about the analysis of Overwatch. This is why you may just see one person, maybe two, on a broadcast who have some kind of professional experience, or rather, I should say, someone whose role on the desk is to be that insight into the professional experience. For example, in the LCS Summer Split, they brought in pro guests whose job was there to provide insight. It's actually something that Rainbow Six has just started doing as well in the North American League. This engages fandom because people like to know about what's going on with pros, but it also provides an uncontestable neutral point on the desk that's just fact rather than opinion, and then the desk can build around that. This is done by building on character dynamics like being the comic relief or being the villain. You could have a pro come on as a guest who got eliminated last week or yesterday or whatever, and they can tell you that we did XYZ because our coach likes off-meta picks. Okay? That is uncontestable. That is a truth. That's a fact that you are being told by this pro who has insight into being a pro. But then you don't want two analysts who are going to sit there and be like, yeah. You could have an analyst who says, that is the most genius thing I've ever heard. I want the team that's still in the competition to do that. And then the other analyst says, no, that is hot garbage. That's why you got eliminated. And I don't want to see the team that's already, you know, still in the competition do that because otherwise they're going to get eliminated too. And immediately you've provided that conflict. And both parts of that conflict are equally as valid as each other. They both provide value. And if you removed that pro player from the equation, that value would not have changed. If a desk just had X pros or X coaches, it would be very easy for that to feel like dry, flat lecturing if you don't have the charisma, the personality, and the comfortability with being wrong that you should have on a desk. If you're never wrong, then the disparity between the expectation for the game and the outcome of the game is never going to be that big, and therefore all your games are going to feel underwhelming. This is why it's always a good idea to have someone who's going to go against a really obvious prediction. It provides a talking point under any circumstances, and it's still gives the viewer a reason to watch an otherwise potentially predetermined game. If you already know the outcome of a game before it happens, then there's little incentive to watch. But if you give some hope that the underdog might win, no matter how small that hope is, it incentivizes the game anyway. This is something that Jad actually spoke about in a recent episode of JLXP, where he talked about why he was the only person out of 16 to predict the underdog team. And the fact that he ended up being right provided so much to the storyline of that team and that game. And even if he had ended up being wrong, it still would have provided a valuable entertainment factor. And regardless of outcome, it provides talking points 
points that otherwise would not have been there because he would have always had to have defended his reason. If Jack's main concern had been preserving his own prediction record, then so much would have been lost from that broadcast and story. Oftentimes, worrying about being right as often as possible is usually not conducive to the best broadcast possible. The fear of being wrong is not unique to one type of analyst, but it's usually seen more in those who value objective correctness over broadcast value. Being wrong can be a tool and it is not a bad thing in broadcast talent. So let's move on to the next point. Why are enthusiasts not the most valuable part of a viewer base? Firstly, let's define an enthusiast. For all intents and purposes, this is someone who is the opposite of a casual viewer. They'll have high hours in game. They oftentimes participate in online fandom and discussion, things like that. And crucially, an enthusiast is more likely to have a high game knowledge or be high elo in a game themselves. So I've already explained that broadcasts are more for the purposes of marketing and not for education, but now we have to figure out to whom we are marketing. Analytics are expensive, so let's do this in an exceptionally crude way. <laughs> Here is the August 2022 League of Legends rank distribution. Assuming that high elo is ranked diamond four or above, we can see that in season 12 of League of Legends, 1.882% of the player base was high elo. Now let's map this onto the LEC summer split average views of 211,743 people. This ends up coming out to 3,985 people. And if you take its peak viewership, which is more likely to have a representative distribution of its elos, it comes to 13,787 of 700 and 32,573 people. That's tiny. Remember that point I made about David Attenborough and Bob Ross and how people who are experts in their field may enjoy the product, but they're very unlikely to learn something new because the level at which you would have to be teaching would be alienating to most viewers. Now let's imagine that here. Would you want to have a broadcast that is alienating and disengaging to nearly 99% of those viewers of the LEC summer split, knowing that you're trying to sell a product to those people? Let's also consider the need for accessibility. While watching the LEC finals, which demographic do you think are going to need a conduit to bridge the gap between their own knowledge and what's happening in game? And which demographic do you think don't need that explanation because they already know? Having a large portion of the broadcast be tailored towards Grandmaster players is gonna benefit neither of those demographics. The first, because they will have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. And the second, because you're just telling them things they already know. This is especially true when you consider the fact that desks typically only get a couple of minutes to speak at a time. And when you're looking at a cast, you usually have a maximum of 30 seconds to yourself. And tying the game's events into an established story and inciting an appeal to emotion through player insights is usually deemed to be more valuable of that time than overly analyzing. It is important, of course, to provide a generally correct explanation as to what's happening in these team fights, but these explanations shouldn't and usually can't be done at a level that surpasses a high elo understanding. And casting can only ever be speculative. Regardless of how high elo you are, people will always have different speculations when it comes to decisions that are made by other people. That's why we have multiple people on a broadcast to discuss these ideas rather than just one to dictate what is the objective truth. This also highlights the difference between being a pro and being a caster at high elo and sort of neutralizes the ostensible value that being a high elo caster brings. An active or ex-pro will always be able to provide some kind of insight that will be beneficial to all parts of the demographic. But usually these insights are more about mentality, communication, how decisions are made, things to do with the player experience. They typically won't get the opportunity to explain the game at a level higher than any kind of qualified analyst or color caster could. That all said, the presence of a pro doesn't negate the need for all of those other dynamics that I spoke about earlier because entertainment is still the number one factor. However, there is in my opinion, an exception. This is low tier events. Lower tier events typically have a more skewed demographic as the people who actually care about them are more likely to be people who are really deeply invested, have higher hours in the game, have a higher game knowledge, and therefore probably higher elo. So on a broadcast for a lower tier event, the audience that you're kind of working with are generally ones who will appreciate that higher technicality in there and more analysis. There's less of a priority on making it 
it into a general entertainment product and therefore you will see more emphasis on those very technical aspects. Now we've looked at the first argument about what makes a good broadcast. Let's move on to the second about whether you need to do something at a high level in order to have a high level theoretical understanding of it. The two false ideas that I'm gonna break down here are as follows. Number one, there is a false idea that doing something at a high level is a necessary prerequisite to having good theoretical understanding of it. Number two, there is a false idea that being high elo automatically means understanding pro level play. So let's look at the first. This is the one that I usually find the most hypocritical because the kinds of people who usually say this are the sorts of people who would be these insane armchair analysts for a football game despite having never scored a touchdown in their lives. The first argument I like to use here is a personal one. I have a degree in theoretical physics. I've never seen a Hadron Collider, but I am qualified to tell you how they work. Now I could go and do an internship at a Hadron Collider and I would be able to come away and tell you what it was like to be there, what it was like to work with other physicists, what it was like to see that science in action. But my ability to explain to you the physics happening in that Hadron Collider has not changed at all. I am equally as knowledgeable as I was then now, the scattering patterns of hadrons are the same whether or not I have been in the room to see them pop up on the screen. And if you were to show me them, I would be able to recognize them and tell you about them whether or not I had been to that Hadron Collider in person. And this is the same for basically anything. I could be a fine art expert despite never having picked up a paintbrush. I might not be able to recreate the art, but I could sure as hell analyze it, recognize it and tell you about it, maybe even to a level that's greater than someone who simply knows how to do the drawing but doesn't really know why and what the analysis of these techniques are. I could become a food critic despite being a terrible cook and my inability to recreate those meals does not negate the fact that I can tell you why they're good or bad and what sort of techniques went into them. In fact, if you want to get really deep about it, you can pose this as a P versus NP problem in computer science. The argument being that a computer can almost definitely verify a correct answer way, 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 way faster than it can ever reach that correct answer itself. I can watch a Valorant game and assess the utility coordination used by that team and then open up Valorant on my own PC and fail to coordinate just even one piece of utility correctly. In fact, for some people, if their main skill set is based in being analytical and not dexterous, it would make a lot of sense as to why they make really good analysts and really bad players. You could take an extreme example where someone suddenly loses all of their limbs and none of their knowledge. Are they now underqualified because they can no longer play and place at Radiant? If your answer is no, then why is it no? Is it because they still retained the same amount of knowledge and therefore they're still qualified? Because if that's true, then that is true for all analysts, regardless if they have working limbs or not. And you've essentially proven via contradiction the point that you don't need to be high rank in order to have valid knowledge of the game. I think the biggest insight that we can get from people who do have experience playing at a high level in the game is things that are external to the gameplay itself. So things like maintaining composure, uh, communication, training regimen, diet, exercise, online versus LAN performance. But the actual understanding of the way the game works is academic. You can theoretically study it. And when people are getting their degrees in history or politics, no one sits there demanding that you have experience as a World War I veteran or having been in the Oval Office in order to receive your degree. You may speak to war veterans or ex-politics to receive unique insights, but none of that is going to change the fact that you know what happened in a sequence of events at some point in the past. This is why I generally find this to be a very misplaced argument because I think a lot of people don't consider the fact that there are so many examples in life that do directly contradict this line of thinking. I think usually it's used against broadcast talent that people have decided they don't like for another reason but can't necessarily place what that is. Sometimes it can be a one-off, like they made a really wrong call in a cast, which can just happen in the heat of the moment. 
it's difficult uh, or it's because the talent hasn't necessarily proven themselves to the community which this is a pretty big thing that talent should do is show that you have an organic interest and not make the community feel exploited that's something that you might see sometimes when a new talent joins a broadcast in an established uh, or even niche esport but for the most part the argument about not being high elo just doesn't hold up so finally let's look at the false idea that being high elo makes you understand professional play better. Now, ironically, this is one of the few things that you should know from playing at high elo. I've only ever played high elo in one game, but I've heard enough accounts from people who played high elo in other games to know that it's basically true universally. Games play very differently in ranked to how they play in a professional environment. This is why we get things like FPL or Champions Q or even just custom lobby Discord servers. People want to play with people who are going to coordinate with them, communicate with them, leave their ego at the door. These are things that you don't often have in ranked. The problem with ladder play is that games reward personal achievement, not team achievement. And that makes sense. Teams aren't staying together after their one game that they were match made into. And the game is designed to keep you chasing that dopamine rush. This is why you see things like people clamoring for entry roles or not wanting to play support or being impatient with their kills, stat padding, all sorts of things like this. In ranked, it's really common to see people just play for their KD and oftentimes not play the theoretically correct way to approach a round because the priority in their ranked game is not the same as it would be in a professional game. For example, in Rainbow Six Siege, it's really common to find players who just don't understand site setups. They'll either reinforce the wrong walls or they'll cover up rotates or they just won't know whether they should be anchoring or roaming. In this case, it's pretty clear to see why a diamond player in Rainbow Six who doesn't know where the correct site rotates are is not more qualified to cast a professional game of Rainbow Six than a gold caster who knows not only where those rotates should be, but why. It's also worth remembering that for a lot of people it's possible to solo climb through mechanics alone and being able to go ham on a gun while that's great for your rank is not going to equip you with any kind of understanding that you need to analyze a professional game. In pro play, there's a lot of sacrifice of personal statistics or achievement in the name of the greater goal. It's not uncommon to see teams rallying around one or two players, funneling in resources, time for that player to then do whatever their planned job is, whether that's to pop off on entry, whatever it may be, that is the plan. As a respawn game in Overwatch, it wasn't uncommon to have situations where you would do genuinely suicidal plays because if somebody died, it was more worth the team's time to just die, respawn at the same time as them, come back with more alt points and be better equipped for the upcoming team fight rather than try and salvage the team fight that you were just in. But that's not how it really works in ranked because not only is communication difficult with a bunch of randos, but also imagine trying to tell your teammate that they should die because they need to help everybody else out. Pro play is a very different thing to high elo play and the ability of a caster to recreate high elo play is not really that relevant in understanding what the professionals are doing in their professional games. Monty was pretty famous in League of Legends for not being particularly high elo player despite being one of the most respected analysts in the game. And in a tweet earlier this year, he said, there isn't a point to developing game mechanics since they are irrelevant in my job. Time is always better spent grinding pro film or talking to pros slash coaches. Playing the game is what people do to avoid the real work of watching tape. I think this is a pretty pertinent perspective from a Hall of Famer as to where the priority should be for a broadcaster. Ultimately, saying you can play in Grandmaster is just a big distraction from actually showing that you can do your job. <laughs> Unless your job is to reach high elo, it simply doesn't matter. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video and found it insightful. This is a topic that I am pretty passionate about, um, you know, partially because as a rite of passage, I have of course been accused of my elo not being high enough, but also just because I am very passionate about the theory behind broadcast, what makes a good broadcast, and, and it means a lot to me to be able to share those kinds of insights uh, with people who may not know. You see this argument come up every now and then on Twitter, um, usually instigated by a pro player who sometimes is just trying to gain the opinions of their audience and sometimes is outright saying that this is what they believe should happen. But I have never seen anyone give any kind of long form explanation or 
more insight or example or opinion on this, usually it's just left to Twitter. And as we all know, Twitter is not the best place to discuss fucking anything. I'd love to hear you guys' opinions. This is something I care very much about and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Let me know in the comments what you thought. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.